Today we will be discussing presidential hopeful Amy Klobuchar's current dilemma and why it could be spelling double standards. And finally, we'll be bringing you the latest CSUF and local news. All this and more on this episode of The Report. Hello and welcome to The Report, Cal State Fullerton's premier source for news, views, and info. I'm Ryan Matthey. I'm Leslie Duarte. And I'm Ashley Antolin. Before we jump straight into our first hot topic, we'd like to invite you to be a part of the discussion this semester. Click the link in the caption of any of our report episodes to fill out a secure Google form with your opinion on any controversial issue that we've talked about now or in the past, as many of these issues are reoccurring and evolving, ranging from gun control to abortion, climate change, and the state of politics. All we ask is for you to keep it civil. As the 2020 elections approach, we continue to see more and more candidates announce their official presidential campaign. So far, there are 12 candidates who have officially announced and filed to run for the 2020 elections. The president, Donald Trump, has been the only Republican candidate to announce his run. The most recent Democratic candidate being Amy Klobuchar, a U.S. Senator from Minnesota, but soon after her announcement, there were many reports of her being verbally abusive towards her staff members. Her reputation has even made it difficult to recruit personnel for her presidential campaign. As a senator, Klobuchar's turn was about 36 percent, which seems low when compared to President Donald Trump's 65 percent among senior ranking advisors. These rumors brought attention because they are contradictory to the kind of persona Klobuchar is known for. Others argue that it is because of the double standard that there is a play between male and female politicians. What do you guys think about this? Is this a double standard? I think it's, as much as it's a double standard, it's just like a classic play on how candidates are kind of playing with each other nowadays to kind of weave out their competition. So not to say that this is something that we should totally avoid and mm -hmm. just like not acknowledge it at all, but however, we can go down the list and every single candidate, like we can talk about the list of Trump's, or the things that Trump has been accused of, um, and people are still gonna vote for him. So it's no, it's more of kind of focusing on maybe their policy viewpoint and what mm -hmm. kind of what they want to change in the future versus maybe, you know, these little small things that don't necessarily affect like us as an entire society. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. I would say that the, the double standard standpoint would come from maybe not so much like the people of America, but maybe the other politicians who are also waiting to announce to run or have already announced to run who are intimidated by a confident woman that's stating what she wants, when she wants it. This is like going back to Hillary. When she announced to run for president, people were intimidated by a woman running for president, and she was mean, and she was angry, and she was controlling. But if you want something, you got to go get it. And if I think that if this was a man, it'd be great. We have another presidential candidate, but she's going to be modeled as this bully. Yeah. No, I definitely, although all those things are true, I think if there are certain concerns, those should be addressed, but equally for male and females. Um, there was so many, when Hillary was running for president, it's like, oh, if she's, um, there's that um, you know stereotype of women having too many hormones and starting a war right away. Mm -hmm. But you know, haven't most wars been started, all wars been started by men? So it's like this double standard that you automatically throw to a female, mm -hmm. but if these alleged rumors or concerns are real, they should be investigated, but equally for whether she's a man or whether she's, or well, whether she's a female or whether he's a male. Like, just let's be equal across the board and. It goes back yeah. to the whole thing when Hillary was running where people were like labeling her as like an old hag right. and saying all these yeah. things like, okay, mm -hmm. she's old, she's getting to that stage. Like she's gonna start, you know, destroying all these things. And we can look at our current president who is, I'm not sure how old he is. I'm not sure how old Hillary are, but I'm assuming they're in like the same right. range. And Trump has done a lot of, controversial stance, or he's made a lot of controversial stances, mm -hmm. made a lot of controversial kind of decisions mm -hmm. um, that these were not kind of listed. He was never listed as an old hag while he was running for president. So yeah, yeah. absolutely, there is the sexism thing that's coming to play. Um, but let's overlook, not to lo overlook what she's done, but to look more at, is she the right candidate yeah. and right. the right person right, right. who's actually gonna affect change for our country? Right, and just like looking at her values and her, like you said, like her stances, like that's mm -hmm. more important to me than whether or not she's controlling because she wants to win, like 
everybody wants to win. Like, that's why you're running to be president, because you think that you're the right person for the job. But are you running for the right reasons? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So, you know? Absolutely. On Friday, President Trump declared a national emergency in order to redirect money to build the wall across the southern border. This was after Congress refused to authorize funding for the wall in the 2019 budget. After the emergency was declared, California Attorney General Xavier Becerra said he plans to take legal action to block the emergency. Congress could also pass a resolution disapproving the declaration. Here's CNN correspondent John Lornick with more on the story. The Trump administration says there's a crisis along the southern border. We're talking about an invasion of our country with drugs, with human traffickers. On Friday, President Trump signed an emergency declaration in order to get more funds for his long-promised border wall. He could choose to ignore this crisis, choose to ignore this emergency, as others have, but that's not what he's going to do. Opinions are split on the issue. If we give away, if we surrender the power of the purse, which is our most important power, uh, there will be little check and no balance left. It'll not be a separation of powers anymore, just a separation of parties. And unfortunately, when it comes to Trump, uh, the Congress is locked down and will not give him what we've given past presidents. So unfortunately, he's got to do it on his own, and I support his decision to go that route. Customs and Border Protection apprehended close to 400,000 people on the U.S.-Mexico border during the 2018 fiscal year. That's according to federal data. Many of those were claiming asylum. That's an increase from the prior year, but less than in 2016. I'm John Lawrence reporting. So how do you guys feel about them, or Donald Trump, making this state of emergency while there's still no clean water in Flint, Michigan? Thank you. Thank, Thank you. God. <laughs> let, me, let me just go down the list of like what some real national emergencies would be. It would be how people in Michigan, they don't got clean water. We don't have, we have relentless gun violence happening mm -hmm. You know, in public spaces, mm. in public schools, we have children being separated from their families at the border. We have climate change that is affecting the entire world, not just us. And then we have Americans dying from health care. So those are national emergencies. Those are right. things that we should all be worried yeah. about. Building a stupid wall because he feels like the incorrect people are coming into our country and they're going to take our jobs or they're going to, you know, ruin our American moral system. That's not an emergency. Mm -hmm. And that's not even yeah. what the issue should be focused yeah. on right now. Yeah, absolutely. And, and just... Yes, yes, thank you, Flint. <laughs> that is a national emergency. Right. Um, but just aside from, let's ignore that this is for a border wall, to declare a national emergency for something is something unprecedented and so controversial that this just really debates uh, congressional and presidential powers. Congress has the power of the purse, and for a president to come and undo that or try to overstep his boundaries is so, so wrong, and um, definitely going to be um, going to the Supreme Court, definitely going to be uh, fighting this uh, mm -hmm. controversial decision, and just on that alone is, like, scary for anybody to do, for whatever reason, to just overstep their boundaries like that and their I, power like that. I think that this is going to be a big test of, of our checks and balances system. Like, Absolutely. He's going to make this bill, and this is what it is, and... National emergency for a wall. Okay, I when I originally started this conversation, it was about Flint, Michigan, and in 2014 is when their water went out. Like they did yeah. it to save money, and they still don't have clean water, and yeah. it was causing issues. They were having rashes, and their blood. There was something wrong with their blood, yeah. and they were getting infections and things like that. And mm -hmm. kids were being really affected by this. Obviously, adults are important as well. But when it starts to mm -hmm. affect children, you would think that it would be taken to another level to try yeah. to get it fixed. And here we are. And I, I remember reading a report that it was around $130 million to, fit, mm -hmm. uh, to fix the water in Flint, Michigan. We're asking for, uh, well, he's originally asking for $5 billion, which is just ridiculous. So let's address the issues that are affecting our nation first. And I'm, I'm all for border security. I think it's important. But not when you have people in Flint, not when you have other people in Puerto Rico, not when you have all these other problems that we could be solving. Mm -hmm. It's so, and it's so awful, like if you saw his address and he was like, you know, listing like, okay, this is a national emergency, he was addressing it as if it was like a game to him. He was saying like, okay, well, we're gonna go to this court, it's not gonna get approved here. We'll go to the next court, it's not gonna get approved here. So we're just gonna go up to the Supreme Court where he has the hookups, where he has his people that mm. he knows are going to support him and back him up in anything that he has to say. And so for him to kind of just treat it and totally 
be oblivious to the other sort of human disasters that are happening in our country, it's not right. Yeah. It's not correct. And it's something that, I don't yeah. know, why is he here? Why is he still here? Uh, clearly, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, well, I don't know either. <laughs> but, That's a great um, question. It, doesn't, it doesn't seem like he knows what he's doing because any other president, I think, has criticized this and been like, this is bad. Just in just doing that, for whatever reason, again, whether it's border, whether yeah. it's gun laws, health care, whatever reason, I mean, he, he even criticized President Obama for some of the things that he's doing mm -hmm. himself now. So, I mean, it's just going to be, how can I put this? Um, interesting. <laughs> interesting to see how this all plays out. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And I guess we'll just wait and see what happens. Um, we're turning over now to more celebrities that are making us mad. Uh, while promoting his new movie, Cold Pursuit, Liam Neeson sat down with The Independent where he shared a very personal story. Neeson explains how over 40 years ago, a close friend of his was allegedly raped by a black attacker. After the friend shared this incident with Neeson, he then decided to walk up and down the streets with a club, hoping to encounter a black person looking to start a fight. The comments were met with backlash, with some even calling him racist. I remembered an incident nearly 40 years ago where a very dear friend of mine was brutally raped. And I was out of the country, and when I came back, she told me about this. And after that, there were some nights I went out deliberately into black areas in this city looking to be set upon so that I could unleash physical violence. The actor then went on Good Morning America to clarify his comments saying he did seek help and has grown from the experience. He hopes this event will help people talk more openly about racism and bigotry. And Liam Neeson's name is just now being added to that list of celebrities that we have where all this old garbage is being picked up from under the rug from years and years and years ago, mm -hmm. and now they have to pay for it. Now they have to go on these national shows. Now they have to beg for forgiveness from these people. Does he deserve this forgiveness? Wow. Um, you know, I, I, I think that this is something that everybody really needs to like sit down and really think about because I had a hard time grasping this story. On, on one end, do you respect the fact that he came out and talked about how he struggled with this issue got help and dealt with it, or do you label him as a racist because the idea came in his head in the first place? Like, how, how do you go about handling that? Well, he yeah. didn't come out blatantly and say, I thought this, and then I went and got help. He said the thoughts that he said, and then because of the backlash, then he had to go on Good Morning America and say that he is now sorry, now he's seeking help for whatever reason, right? So in the first place, yeah. We should think, why is it coming to your head in the yeah, first place? Right. I, I understand the pain and just like the feelings that you're going to get, especially when it's coming from someone, you know, one of your really close, deep right. friends. Uh -huh. But to label an entire group population, of people, right, an entire right. population of people as yeah. rapists or something awful, it's not right. It's not correct. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, you know, I think it is, um, I did want to clarify something you said. Did mm -hmm. he, this happened 40 years ago, he wanted to to hurt, harm people, mm -hmm. um, and then he seek for help, and then went to do the interviews? He or, made the comments, you... he made the comments with uh, Independent, and then after that interview was released, then once he was experiencing the backlash from the general public, that's when he went on Good Morning America and then was clarifying his comments, which okay. there's nothing to clarify if <laughs> okay. you are blatantly yeah. Yeah. Right. being racist you know, towards a group of people. You know, right. I think um, you, you said something that was really um, important, you know, the fact that the setting of where he said this and how he said it has a lot to do with it, um, it's it's really controversial to just say what he said, but to think what he said, but also in, in, in my mind, it's like, okay, this guy, Liam Neeson, mm -hmm. he had these thoughts, and to to a point, it's like, how how do you, we, okay, there's no, there's no excuse for what he said. It was completely racist. Um, but in a way, I kind of felt like he was ashamed of it. Mm -hmm. He was ashamed of it. Like, he was really remorse about what he was saying and how he said and how that happened 40 years ago. But also, where's the proof? Where's the proof? If you are really um, asking for forgiveness and you really are ashamed of what you did and how you thought... Um, Where's the proof? What have you done since to help? Well, I feel like, what do they do? You know, like, like 
these YouTubers who make apology videos on their YouTube channel and they're like, I'm so sorry for the comments that I made. Please forgive me. And then all of their yeah. fan bases and stands are back. Like, yeah. how do you go about making someone like Liam Neeson, who's a very respected actor, mm -hmm. right? And how do you go about making an apology and asking for forgiveness and trying to make up for it without looking like you're trying too hard or not doing enough? Or sincere. Yeah, yeah and, and it, being sincere. Yeah. Because now you, you, essentially he exposed himself and, and told the world that this is what happened. So how do you bounce back? Correctly. It gets more into a topic or an issue. It's, is he sorry that he said what he said or is he sorry that he got caught? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. No, absolutely. Um, and I think he addressed those, those that happened 40 years ago and he addressed that and um, he says that he seeked help to with rabbis and pastors and his church. But, um, you know, the question is, where's the proof? How do you come out and not make it a publicity stunt that you're sorry and actually be sincere and I think it, it comes with action and talking to the people who you offended you know um, <clears throat> excuse me when you don't address these um, racist thoughts that you have in your head or because it was it was completely racist what he was doing that is racism but um, when you don't address those properly you can learn from society or those thoughts can grow into something more serious and um, for him to be sincere and actually show to the culture that he is uh, sorry for what he did and for how he felt at a time, um, he needs to relate to the culture, he needs to talk to the culture, he needs to talk and show work towards his actions becoming better. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. February is more than just flowers and chocolates for Valentine's Day, it's also Black History Month. And in honor of this special month, Adidas unveiled a Black History Month shoe but faced severe backlash because of the shoe's color. Adidas released their collection featuring an all-white Ultra Boost titled Uncaged. They quickly recalled the shoe after sneaker lovers took to Twitter, heavily criticizing the completely white shoe. Adidas made a press release stating, quote, toward the latter stages of the design process, we added a running shoe to the collection that we later felt did not reflect the spirit or philosophy of how Adidas believes we should recognize and honor Black History Month. After careful consideration, we have decided to withdraw the product from the collection, end quote. It's another semester filled with brand new classes, but one familiar sight students noticed upon returning was the fencing around the Central Quad area. The fences are part of an estimated $8 million renovation that began last fall. The first phase of construction is expected to be completed by commencement of 2019. The goal of the project is to create fire lane access, wheelchair accessibility, outdoor learning spaces with Wi-Fi towers, and a south gate. February 14th marked the first year anniversary of the Parkland shooting, the deadliest high school shooting in U.S. history. Following the shooting, students involved themselves in gun reform conversations because they felt like politicians were failing them. On February 12th, student journalists from all over the country revealed the year-long project since Parkland. The website presents stories of kids lost to school shootings, armed domestic violence, drug homicides, and unintentional discharges. Plus, Parkland Inside Building 12A, a film by Charlie Min, was released in limited theaters across the country. The film includes interviews of the students who were inside the building where the shooting took place. Raw footage of the event, and quote, shows what it's like to truly face the ultimate test of humanity and the effects of that test on a young generation, end quote. So I think that, that this film and showing the, the inside of the Parkland shooting definitely gives a whole new insight to not only what happened, but what it's like to be those students. And, you know, with the whole gun reform conversation, a lot of people address the fact that it's not about owning the guns in the first place. It's about what the mental issues of people who have them or, or their backgrounds and things like that. Like, it's not just owning a gun. It's all of that that in, goes into getting one. Mm -hmm. So I, being a survivor of that, I cannot even imagine having to have the conversation with somebody who is for guns. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's, just, it's such a sad topic that we have to address mm -hmm. to our children now that we, it's become so frequent that it's happening to everyone. It's happening to elementary school children. Yeah. So it's very sad that this is now a topic that we have to discuss with you know our future generations. But I think it is a very 
well put together piece um, that's really addressing these different issues that we need to address. Yeah, um, I, I can't believe it's been a year. Um, and what's even more unbelievable that after Sandy Hook, right. nothing changed. Um, it's, it's heartbreaking where we are and that our children have to be affected. I think there has to be reasonable gun reform um, and it has to be quick. Right. And the key word that you said there is reasonable gun reform. Like, there are some groups that are advocating for guns to be gone completely, but that's really unrealistic, okay? Mm -hmm. Like, it, it really is. The reasonable part of this is asking for deeper background checks, okay? Checking mental stability, right? And, and checking the actual backgrounds of people, their family life, anything that could trigger them, and like things like that. Also, who is at home when you have a gun? If you are a parent and you have a teenager or you have a young child and you know that they have some issues, is it smart for you to have a gun? Probably not. But then it goes into this mm. deeper discussion of then what about their defense, you know, because a lot of people own these guns just for their self-defense def uh -huh. if something, you know, God forbid something or someone was to come into their house. Mm -hmm. um, but then there are other ways of protecting yourself than yeah. just a gun, right. you know, and yeah. so I think that's something that needs to be addressed as yeah. well. Right. Um, I saw a documentary that Vice did on Canada's gun laws. Mm -hmm. Canada has the strictest gun laws on this side of the world, and yet most of their population owns guns. So this is a good example on how this country is able to manage strict gun laws, but also give them the freedom of to their civilians to own the guns. And I think um, they did a really good report on that. If uh, I always suggest out things that I watch, I'm always putting in the plug for Vice. <laughs> but you know, plug I for I, Canada. I know, <laughs> but I always. Um, encourage people to look at different perspectives. Right. What are other countries doing that we're not doing? Because unfortunately, the thing that we're good at is always having a report of mass shootings, mass shootings, mass shootings. Absolutely. And I think it's time for change. <laughs> um, that's all the time we have today for the report. Have a great weekend, everybody, and stay tuned for more news, views, and info. I'm Leslie Luare. And I'm Ashley Insulin. And I'm Ryan Matthew. Stay fresh, Fullerton. Mm -hmm.